trust you had a good afternoon, some time meditating in the Word, some time perhaps resting, getting ready for this evening. As we go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, let me just refresh our minds very quickly with where we've been this morning without going over every detail. We are looking at the praise to God for true believers found here in chapter 1, the fact that a true believer will exhibit signs of spiritual growth. It's an important benchmark when an individual wants to claim that they have trusted Christ, there ought to be some evidence, some change, an evidence of the new birth. A growth in faith, a growth in love. All of these things are mentioned in the first three verses of this chapter. And then we looked at verse 4, that believers, the true believer, should showcase the endurance that comes from genuine faith. The endurance to face life's trials. And when that endurance is there, notice uh, we talked about the fact that there is just cause for boasting, that's the word that the Apostle Paul uses under inspiration there uh, in the beginning of verse 4, that there is boasting that is possible as he goes from church to church, sharing what God is doing in Thessalonica and impressing upon other churches what God could well do in their own midst. This is all based on their steadfastness and their continuing faith which is seen in the light of all of these difficulties that they have been encountering as a very young church. So it's not their business acumen. It's not their mega church approach. It's nothing that you could say is so often put as a benchmark for today's church. Rather, it is this spiritual life that is evident in the life of these believers. And that brings us to verse 5. This is evidence. Now, the word this refers back to their steadfastness and faith from verse 4. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. This word worthy figures in another time in this chapter and in this context really seems to come to us a little bit crossways, so to speak. It, does, it seems to be the opposite of what we would expect. How can we be worthy of God's blessing? And yet that is the context that these believers be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. But let's back up and we'll come to that point here in just a few moments. We're going to state the point this way, that a true believer will give evidence of being worthy of the kingdom of God as is said in this verse or as worthy believers in a more general sense. Their enduring faith that we just mentioned in the previous verse, is the evidence that is referenced here. And the word that uh, we're using as evidence there is a word that means to demonstrate something. Something that is an apparent truth because of the proof of it. So the word evidence is a very good translation for this concept. The enduring faith of these individuals, the evidence of their true conversion is, on the other hand, evidence of God's right judgment, evidence that God has judged rightly. To put it this way, he chose believers well. A true believer vindicates that by allowing the work of God to be manifest in his or her life. In other words, we're saying that by our lives, God's divine election is proven to be wise. Not because we're all that great specimens, but because God, in his great wisdom and power, is able to transform us from the sinners that we are naturally to the obedient believers that we can be through his grace. And as we mentioned in the earlier verses this morning, it is God's work of perseverance that sustains believers through 
this process of growth to the point of being considered worthy, manifesting the rightness of God's judgment. Or to put it this way, those who choose to believe will show their true character. Those who truly have chosen to believe will have a character demonstrated in the quality of their life. They will show themselves to be, as is said in this verse, worthy of the kingdom of God or worthy subjects of God's kingdom. Now, does that mean that Paul is advocating here that some people can earn their own salvation? Of course, we know the answer to that question is no. But it kind of sounds that way to our ear, doesn't it? To place it in the way that it is here by inspiration seems a little bit off kilter to other teaching. And so we want to clarify that whatever our minds may be registering, Scripture is clear that salvation cannot be earned by us. It is earned by Jesus Christ for us. Our duty is accepting it and then living it out. Rather than being an, a statement that seems to preach a salvation by works, this is rather a commendation of genuine faith. As someone has summed up the book of James, it's not that we're saved by our works, but true salvation, true faith works. It's the same thing that you see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're not saved by works, but then verse 10, we are God's handiwork to produce good works. So we're saved not by good works, but for good works. And that's what's being stated here as well. So that in our lives, we are vindicating God's choice. We are showing that we truly are the sons and daughters of God. And in other words, that our faith is not vain. Because as we can all recall and think of unfortunate cases, there are individuals who make a profession of faith and may show signs of growth for a time and then they just throw it all away. And they disappear. And you can only conclude that they came so close, like Hebrews 6 describes, they came so close to salvation that it was almost like they tasted the good gift of God. And then they turned away from it. And unfortunately, unless there is another true conversion experience in their life to offset the false conversion. There, this is not eternal life that we're talking about because true believers keep coming back to truth in spite of the frailty and the faltering of our nature. But it is persecution that kind of brings all of this to
grace, then we approach the throne of grace. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, that throne of grace is available to us in spite of the fact that we're undeserving, but because of the fact that we're in Christ, that we have that standing in his grace. And to sum it all up, our only progress in the, is the sanctifying grace of Christ. It's the only kind of progress we can have. It's progress in this sanctifying grace. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, But of him are you all in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Remember, redem uh, sanctification is holiness. It's all this same thing that we've been talking about. So by God's goodness, we are in Christ and Christ to us, by the Father, has been made wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The way forward is only through Jesus Christ. So what is the disciples' hope of full sanctification? It is all of these resources we've looked at through verses 23 through 28 the God of peace, the faithfulness of God, the prayer of God's people, the fellowship of the saints, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are what bring us sanctification. I wonder if we're adequately employing these tools that are intended to help us toward the goal. Yes, we always say we'll never reach full sanctification in this life but notice again the words of verse 23. The very God of peace sanctify you how? Holy, complete to the end. And I pray, God, your what spirit, soul, and body? Whole, that is complete in every part. Be preserved how? Blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is full sanctification. We're not talking sinless perfection, but we're getting as close to it as is humanly possible given the grace of God operating within us. I hope we're making that our pursuit. Let's pray and then we'll ask Ray to come and lead us in a final hymn. Father, we thank you for this teaching regarding the sanctifying influences that you have left to be a part of our lives. May each of us determine to apply the full weight of each of these tools in our lives to accomplish the purpose and the work that you want to accomplish in us so that we're never satisfied but always progressing toward the mark of perfection in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would do this for your glory because we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. But on the other hand, the lack of gratitude is dealt with in Rome, or excuse me, I don't know why I have Ephesians there. Let me look, I right, skipped one there. Did I skip one altogether? Yes, I did. Sorry about that. Number three is missing there. Let me read that for you. Romans 1.21, it talks about lack of gratitude being a sign of a reprobate heart. You remember there in Romans chapter 1, there is that catalog of the sins of humankind. And verse 21 says that whereas when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And in short order, it says that God begins to turn mankind over to his reprobate heart and mind. So a lack of gratitude is a sign of a reprobate heart. 
It's someone who is not properly related to God. And then we come to Ephesians 5 and verse 4, which says, Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, rather giving of thanks. So there's a great contrast here. And the idea is that giving thanks supplants or takes the place of all sorts of corrupt speech. Instead of corrupt speech being in our mouth and in our hearts, God wants thankfulness to be there. In everything, give thanks. And all of these reasons are why a believer should abound in thanksgiving. Colossians 2 verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving abounding in all of these things in the state of thanksgiving. So abounding in thanksgiving is a part of a description, a short description of a believer's life as a part of God's will. But the direct statement here relating this to the final phrase of verse 18, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This idea of giving thanks in everything is part of the will of God as well. We have some, again, very basic thoughts expressed to us in Scripture in very familiar verses that lead us to the inescapable conclusion that God uses everything that comes into our lives to accomplish good in us. Romans 8, verse 28, we know, and if we made that a more active translation, that it is God who is working all things together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God is at work putting things together in our lives in such a way that it produces ultimate good, which is identified there just a a verse or two later, that is the conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. And just as the life and ministry of Christ didn't only contain good and pleasant things, there was also a cross involved, great suffering. So for us, we cannot expect that conformity to the image of Christ. You remember, as Paul stated his life's goal in the book of Philippians, he wanted to know Christ even concerning the fellowship of his sufferings. We have to welcome that as well. Because that's a part of producing the image of Christ in us. God uses these things which to us seem perhaps a challenge to the concept that God is in control. And yet, these things are the very substance of lessons that God is trying to teach us to bring about good in our lives. And so it is that we should be thankful for all things, no matter whether we enjoy them or don't enjoy them. Ephesians 5 verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's plan. That's God's will for us. So therefore, our giving thanks, and again, I'm sorry, we skipped number three, it seems. Our prayer and supplication should be presented with thanksgiving, Philippians 4, verse 6. Let your requests be made known, your prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And finally, giving thanks is evidence of the Spirit's control. Ephesians 5, verses 18 through 20. These verses tell us, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves. This is what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. You notice the ING words that follow that statement. They're all illustrative of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. If you are, you will be speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You will be singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And you will be giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of these give evidence of spirit control, of spirit filling in the life of a believer. 
It is God's will for us to always rejoice, to unceasingly pray, and in everything give thanks. Each of these things is to be the unceasing occupation of each believer. It is something God wants for us. It's a measure of growth in our lives. And so I say that growth in discipleship is evidenced by the continuing practice of this rejoicing, this praying, and this giving of thanks at all times and in all things. And whether we're talking about the disciple maker or the disciple, both need to immerse themselves in joyful, prayerful, and grateful Christianity. Why is so much of supposed Christianity so joyless? Why is it that so much of church life is perfunctory, if any prayer at all? Or why is it that there seems to be a lack of gratitude? Each of these things is very important and is couched in the context of being God's will for us. Each of us is a disciple of Jesus Christ if we know him by faith. So again, I say that it is God's will for each and every one of us to always rejoice, unceasingly pray, and in everything give thanks. Let's pray. Father, use your word to shape our minds and our thoughts. Give us a holy dissatisfaction with a Christian walk that does not find itself described in these three phrases that we've looked at this evening. May our minds be drawn to our need to rejoice, our need to pray, and our need to be thankful. Use this word in us for the coming week and on beyond that, that we might fulfill your will for us in these aspects. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.